me. <laughs> Only she had green eyes. Stop. Tell her Dr. Spencer. Fire! You're not yourself today, are you? No, I'm not. Welcome back to the 11th annual Halloween special. I hope you guys are having a great time. I certainly am. And I'm really excited to talk to you guys tonight about What Lies Beneath, a 2000 horror thriller directed by Robert Zemeckis. The film stars Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer, and it's about a wife of a university research scientist who believes that her lakeside Vermont home is haunted by a ghost or that she's losing her mind. My second favorite piece of trivia about What Lies Beneath, I'll tell you my number one in just a second, is that this film was shot while Tom Hanks lost weight for Castaway. Because the first half of Castaway takes place while he's learning about the island, and then there's that massive cut where it's four years later, and Tom Hanks really did lose all that weight for the role. So while he worked on his diet, Robert Zemeckis decided to shoot an entire film. But my favorite piece of trivia about What Lies Beneath is that it was written by Clark Gregg. Yeah, that Clark Gregg. He wrote this, Choke, and Trust Me. I honestly didn't know he wrote. I'm kind of embarrassed. When I read his name in the credits, I was like, no, it's impossible. It's got to be like some random other guy with the exact same name, but it really is him. And the film was very successful. The budget was $100 million, and just in the States alone, it grossed 155, but 291 worldwide. Despite all of that success, the film received fairly mixed reviews and over the years is not talked about that much, and I have found that discussion around the film has tapered off with each year. And the only reason I noticed that is because I love this movie. I have for many years, and so I'm kind of paying attention more than most, and I just don't see people talking about what lies beneath, and I can understand why. It is by no means a masterpiece. I think about 10 to 15 minutes of the movie could be lifted. In fact, I've analyzed the film so much that in my head I've got my own cut of the movie that I think would really make it perfect, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. If you want to call this movie an imitation of Hitchcock, that's fine. It's one of my favorite versions of that, and Zemeckis has been very upfront about the fact that the goal was to make a Hitchcock movie, but with the technology of the year 2000 that Hitchcock never had access to. And despite some baggage mostly in the center of the film and a lot of red herrings and scenes that maybe don't have to be there, this movie is very suspenseful and features some of the best camera work of Robert Zemeckis' entire career. Now keep in mind, I said camera work, okay? That's all I'm talking about, because I know that not everybody likes this movie. This film is shot so remarkably well that there are entire chunks of this movie where I am so mesmerized that I kind of forget to breathe. To talk about some of those sequences, I will be discussing some spoilers. If you've never seen the movie, that's your warning. Let's talk first about the casting, Michelle Pfeiffer and Harrison Ford. If you guys have seen the movie, you know where things go. This is really good casting. Not only are both of them famous for playing characters that wield whips, I don't know where I was going with that. Michelle Pfeiffer is fantastic in the movie for many reasons, but in particular because the character on the page is not all that great. She's defined by a car accident in the past that we don't know that much about, and her present day paranoia that won't go away and keeps increasing. Despite those limitations of a character, Michelle Pfeiffer makes her endlessly fascinating by how good she is in every single scene, and you believe all of the trauma that she's bringing to this movie. But the real expert casting is in Harrison Ford, because of course, he's one of the most likable and bankable stars ever. That's easy. You get your studio execs very happy. You can say Harrison Ford's in the movie. Oh, great, let's do it. But what's great about it is that, as I said, spoilers, once again, I'll warn you, his character is the villain, but it's a slow villain reveal. You first learn that he's done some things of, shall we say, ill repute, He's been involved in an affair. He admits to that, but he's still holding back. He later admits to the fact that she was threatening him and his wife in various ways. A little more has come to the surface, and every single time that he's admitting to these deeds, we want to believe him because it's Harrison Ford. We don't want to think that this guy would do these horrible things. It's one of the reasons I love movies like Collateral because you just don't see Tom Cruise playing a villain. And you just don't see Harrison Ford doing it either. And because we love this guy so much, 
not just as an on-screen persona, but because Robert Zemeckis and Clark Gregg have done such a good job of building up a realistic marriage where they really do seem like they're in love. You just don't want him to be the guy, but he is. And that's expert casting. But back to that camera work, what Zemeckis has done here with very long takes is a real joy for me to behold because you get to watch these actors act. They exist in a space and we understand that space, but not just that, there's very complicated blocking when it comes to looking at very specific things that Zemeckis wants us to be paying attention to. There's a sequence in the movie where we follow Michelle Pfeiffer towards a bathroom and then she looks at the phone and thinks about dialing the police, but then we look upwards towards a mirror and we see other things that we need to see and it's so well constructed that it truly is staggering. He also lets his actors have very real moments together. There's a part in this movie where Harrison Ford is woken up in the middle of the night by his wife who believes that she just saw something very concerning next door at the neighbor's house. And his reaction is peak, husband just got woken up at 3 a.m. by his wife for nothing. I, th I, th I thought I saw, I- What? I thought I saw oh, something. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, that is exactly the reaction to, oh my God, I am up right now and I don't have to be. I just want to go back to bed. Why'd you do this? What's also interesting about the film's structure is that they found a way to make most of the first act be based around what eventually becomes a red herring, except not. Because for the beginning of the movie, she is suspecting that her next door neighbor has done something awful to his wife. It's very rear window, as this movie, once again, pays a lot of homage to Hitchcock films. Eventually, we discover that that is not the case. This guy is not the villain. In fact, Robert Zemeckis, in a very telling shot, literally pans away from him, establishing our focus on who becomes the primary villain. The reason I love what the screenplay has done, though, with this structure is that Yes, technically, our focus is no longer on this couple. Nothing really is going on there. But everything that we were learning while she was investigating that couple still factors in to the rest of the mystery. And so they found a way to misdirect our attention elsewhere to wonder if something was going on next door while still telling us imperative information about the central mystery that eventually develops. It is really good writing. There's also a scene with actress Wendy Crewson, who interestingly just played the first lady in Air Force One with Harrison Ford three years prior to this. And in this scene during this double date, the men start talking to each other and the women start talking to each other all at the same time at this table and the camera just stays on them for this entire conversation. I can only imagine a lot of rehearsal went into this and the actors really nailed this, but it's also incredibly realistic. You don't see that a lot in movies because it happens all the time. If you've ever been out with friends, you sort of start focusing on one person who's at a table and you're talking with them and other people are talking next to you and that doesn't really get communicated that much in movies because it's very hard to do. You've got to mix all that audio in post, which is tough. You got to choose who you're hearing more over the other. And the actors have to be able to focus on the other person. And it just feels so real. I know I'm talking about this specific scene that for most might feel throwaway, but it's not. These types of details matter. And they're extremely difficult sometimes to achieve as well as Zemeckis has. As the supernatural element of the film starts to creep in, it's very clear that this ghost that's haunting or might not be haunting Michelle Pfeiffer is helping her investigate. Every good detective needs a ghost that can point them in the right direction. And what's cool is that the ghost almost takes the place of that old trope that you sometimes see in movies where you need someone to look at something but you don't know how to get that character to go to look at that thing so maybe something falls off of a table or they hear a sound or there's something else that directs their attention in that way and you always are looking for those moments in a movie for it to feel real in some way like you know someone picks up a book oh I, I remember this book and something falls oh what's that it fell out of the book oh it's a very important photograph that I'm supposed to know about for the plot it happens all the time you see it all at the beginning of Insidious there's a scene like that with Rose Byrne when she's looking through her photo album. The fact that this movie uses the ghost as a way to get Michelle Pfeiffer to look at things that we need to know is kind of ingenious. Now I want to talk about this film's third act because I really do think that technically it is masterful. 
the immobilization sequence where Michelle Pfeiffer is given this drug that limits her movement is truly one of the more suspenseful sequences I've ever seen. She's thrown into a bathtub and the water is slowly running and she cannot move. And as it creeps further and further towards her nose, the tension is at an all time high. All the while you've got Harrison Ford over there telling her all these horrific things that are like sociopathic because he's been amazing at making himself look like a victim this whole time. Like he didn't really do anything wrong and it was all for her. But now he's just petting his dog while he slowly kills his wife. And throughout this sequence, Zemeckis does so many incredible things with the camera like this shot where we seemingly disappear into the floor. And watching the movie, I can only assume that this was probably like a glass floor with some sort of entryway for the camera to dip underneath and then they CGI'd the floor. Really innovative camera work like this continues for the rest of the movie. When she flees into her car and the side mirror reveals Harrison Ford's shadow getting up and then her continuing to run away. Or this shot where we're outside of the truck and then we're in it on the wheel spinning. Some of these shots are brain melting. Obviously some CG transitions are occurring but they're really seamless for a 23 year old movie. There are whole sequences in this movie where I kind of just forget that I'm watching a film and I remain in awe at how well edited and shot it is and the score by Alan Silvestri as well, which feels very Bernard Herrmann-esque. Some people had a problem with the idea of the ghost sort of manifesting itself and helping her at the end of the movie, but I feel like those people just don't watch horror movies. That's like the, the lowest shocking thing I've ever seen. It's like, I, of course a ghost would help. I've seen that before. It's not that weird. Like, I don't know. Like, it felt like people were like, whoa, 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 whoa. You just broke the rules of a thriller or something. I'm like, guys, have you ever watched movies? I don't know. But I really do think this movie is criminally underrated. I think it's a bit too long. I think that every therapist scene, as much as I like the actor Joe Morton, I think every therapist scene can go. I think there's one too many dinner parties. I understand why they're there, because you kind of understand why Ford's character was so concerned about public humiliation. If people found out about what he did, it would ruin him. You have to kind of see him out and about and understand that he's known in the community and that he's an important figure. I also think that the rear window stuff of the first act with the couple can be shortened a bit because eventually, yes, it is a red herring. As I said, you are learning information you need to know about the plot that comes later. But in the moment, it does kind of feel like, oh, so that wasn't important at all. The movie's about two hours and 10 minutes. I think there is like an hour and 50 minute version of this movie that would be absolutely amazing. But in terms of suspense building, in terms of tension, in terms of using the camera to make you feel like Every move is going to reveal something that tightens your gut. What Lies Beneath is one of the best examples of that. And if you've never seen it, please watch it. And if you saw it and dismissed it, maybe give it a rewatch because I do think that this is one of those movies that has improved significantly with age. There's a lot of films from the 90s to 2000s era pre-streaming that I think have aged very well because as I've said before, they really do not make movies like this anymore. $100 million budget, letting a director do whatever they want, two massive stars, and it's long, and it's got like a pretentious title <laughs> and it's really good and it made so much money, like a lot. I, I kind of am blown away by that and very encouraged by it. But again, they just would not make this movie now. And if they did, it would be shot for like $5 million to be put out by Blumhouse or even the Lifetime Channel Network or something. I love the film. I always have. Guys, thank you so much for continuing to watch the 11th annual Halloween special. I'm curious to know what you think of What Lies Beneath. Thank you as always, and if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.